Hey, uh, free agent question for you. Do you uh, have you signed Masai yet? <laughs> I don't know. I had dinner with him last night. I had breakfast with him this morning. He's upstairs making phone calls. So I think he's busy. So you're tampering is what you're telling me. <laughs> Can't deal with free agents till August 2nd. Um, I guess in, uh, one question I had regarding the draft is, you know, of, of the players you've been able to work out and visit with, is there, have you found guys who have kind of qualities above the athletic and, and the skill, the athleticism and skill that these guys all seem to have. Are you, have you encountered guys who really have the other elements that you guys look for in your players? And if you could say like, what kind of things are you looking for beyond the, the skill and the athleticism? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's the benefit of, of being able to, to bring the guys here. Obviously we're in Tampa, not Toronto, but you know, you get extended time with them. You get to have dinner with them. You get to sit around and talk basketball. They get to meet with, you know, coach nurse. They get to meet with, uh, you know, our medical staff. So you really get uh, an opportunity for the whole organization to get a feel for them, uh, not just as basketball players, but as, but as people. Um, and at the same time, you know, they're, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old kids. And so you also have the opportunity to, to project them and, and, you know, try to figure out the type of character and, and characteristics that, um, you know, we value. And so I think over the years, everyone here is pretty familiar. We like, you know, mentally tough, versatile, um, you know, players that want to get better, players that are willing to put in the hard work, uh, players that are going to buy into, you know, offense and defense and the systems that we run. Um, so having them come here, obviously, was a, it was a bit of a different year with COVID. You know, we were able to get out and watch some games, but not as much as, as we typically do. And as most of you know, being able to watch them on the sidelines, watch them in the huddle, um, you don't really get that from TV. So maybe... Um, you know, it's more valuable for us to bring them in here and get a sense of who they are. Thanks, Bobby. Next question goes to Josh Lewinberg from TSN. Hey, Bobby, how's it going? What's up, Josh? Not much, man. Thanks for doing this. Um, when we talked to you after the lottery, you spoke about being pretty uh, open with, with different options and exploring different things you can do with the pick, whether it's using it or trading it. How much have those options narrowed for you since and how much of those things are still on the table going into tomorrow? Obviously, they're starting to narrow now. We're, I guess, you know, 36 hours away. Um, so, you know, we have a, a you know, we're going to have all of our options open, trading up, trading back, staying where we are. Um, but, yeah, I'd say there's probably, you know, three to four options now that we're, you know, more seriously considering, um, you know, to do with the pick. Uh, obviously being at four, you don't know who's going to go one, two, three. So you need to have those scenarios played out. If your guy's there at four, or if your guy's not there at four, or you're comfortable with a couple guys at four and you can trade back. Um, but yeah, I think those are starting to narrow as far as what are we realistic? What are we, uh, you know, what would we actually do tomorrow? You guys often talk about using the, take the best player available approach but for a team like yourselves that, that are balancing both short-term and long-term competitive windows, how do you weigh a player that you might view as the best player now versus a player that you might think is the best player in three or four years from now or could be the best player in three or four years from now? Yeah, I think we're always going to go with the latter, which is who do we think long-term is the best player? Um, as, as everyone knows, you know, turnover in the league is so high, I think even more so than in the past, um, you know, get that player. And if, you know, one or two or three years down the line, the fit quite isn't perfect, um, you know, we'd rather have that problem than taking a player now who maybe fits, but, um, you know, two, three, four years down the line isn't good enough, so. Great, thanks, Bobby. Good luck tomorrow. Next question goes to Eric Kareen from The Athletic. Hey, Bobby, thanks for taking the time. Um, I know you guys, don't you have your own individual board and you don't sort of uh, go with any sort of league wide consensus. I'm just wondering from a trading up or trading down perspective, is there value in becoming familiar with that consensus? So you know where sort of the, the leverage might be with a certain pick or is it so much like each team is individualized that it doesn't, that there is no consensus really? It's a good question. I mean, I'm sure people have gone back and looked at, you know, consensus pre-draft versus what actually happened. 
Um, so I think the consensus is helpful just as far as like, you know, who potentially could go in a specific range, but as far as players going to a specific team, I think it's hard to predict that in advance. So I think it's more of, you know, who are the, the maybe the groupings of players and where would those groups of players go as opposed to who's specifically going to go, uh, you know, to which team or whatnot. Because I think that's where it gets into what you said, which is each team's very specific. And, um, you know, they may have one guy ranked two, another team may have them ranked five, and both teams get what they want. Um, so I don't know if that, that answered your question. But I, I guess the short answer is no, we don't put a ton of it, ton of stock in it other than uh, the general groupings and tiers in, in, in the draft. Um being at the fourth pick, being relatively high in the draft, does it create more opportunity to, cre to, to maybe get another asset or get more value out of the selection, I guess, um, and capitalize on, on those teams? Or, or how do you see that? I think it's pretty simple. It's obviously easier to trade back than trade up, right? And so what you're talking about is trading back and collecting, collecting multiple assets. Um, I think at a certain range, you kind of want to stay in the same tier and hopefully, you know, you just value something differently and you get two or three guys, or maybe you get a player that's more established. Um, so I think that that's always the goal. Um, and then trading up is, you know, the asking price is always high, whether we're at four trying to trade up to one, two or three, or whether someone's at, you know, 25 trying to, trying to trade up to 15. Makes sense, Bobby. Appreciate it. Next question goes to Ryan Wallstadt from the Toronto Sun. Hey, Bobby. Uh, when we talked to Dan about three weeks ago, he said the, the kind of the job down the stretch is just comparing the guys over and over again, almost to the point of exhaustion to, to get the final feel on them. Do you feel like you guys have uh, gone to that point? We're close. We're uh, pretty exhausted. Yeah. And another thing, um, we talked to, uh, some of us talked to Scotty Barnes and Jalen Suggs and Evan Mobley on NBA media calls, and they all sort of praise the Raptors player development uh, system. Like, what does it mean to the team to, to hear, like, top guys praising the, the organization? Obviously, it's been a long road and a lot of work has gone into all that. Yeah, exactly. I think it's nice to hear. I think it's, um, you know, a testament to the entire organization's dedication to it. And I think, you know, in, in, in many ways, it's also a challenge to continue to live up to that and, and to continue to produce players and continue to um, have them come in and evaluate them and have them feel like, uh, you know, our interests are their best interests, which is getting them better as a player, which ultimately contributes to the team. Um, so starting to have that, I think, is, is you know, not, not, good, not beneficial only at number four, but, you know, in the second round and guys that, uh, you know, we get undrafted or summer league players. And so you, you kind of permeates down, but obviously having, having that at the top of the list obviously gets more media attention. All right, thanks. Next question goes to Steve, oh, Doug Smith from the Toronto Star. Bobby, how are you, sir? What's up, Dougie? Not much, man. So you can't talk about team president free agency, but um, how do you balance the draft and NBA player free agency and the, and the need to one to flow into the other? That's a good question. You're doing them simultaneously, right? You're preparing for the draft. You're preparing for different options in free agency. Um, obviously, things can happen on draft night that would affect free agency. So it's a little tough to, uh, to you know, lock into anything really early. We want to see how tomorrow night goes. But then you have to very quickly on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I think free agency opens at 6 on Monday, uh, you know, be ready to, uh, to pounce on any deals then. Um, so there's pre-work going in now, and I think really the majority of the, the work will, will happen tomorrow night based on what happens around the league, because undoubtedly there will be movement, um, you know, significant movement. At some point, though, do you, do you look at the selection tomorrow night with an eye to what might happen Monday night? Not really. I think it gets back to the fit. Um, you know, obviously you can have too many at a certain position, and then that does, that does affect it. Um, but I think where we are now, I don't see a position that would be so, so, so deep that it would really affect our free agency. Great. Thanks very much. Good luck tomorrow night, man. Thanks. Next question goes to Stephen Lung from Sportsnet. Hey, Bobby. Thanks for doing this. What's up, Stephen? 
Um, bit of a different question, but like uh, with with the uh, Toronto FC and the Toronto Blue Jays back back in Toronto, like like what what does that do? What does that do for you know like the the hope that you guys can can safely return and, and play next season in Toronto? Yeah, obviously a positive sign. You know, we we had the benefit of going after those two, and so uh, you know, hopefully all the hard work and um, you know national interest exemptions. I think that's what it's called um, that are being discussed. Is you know bodes well for us in the future. We're obviously all really excited and uh, looking forward to coming back to Toronto. Um, and hopefully that means we're playing games and fans are in the stands. So, uh, you know, thanks to them, they're doing some of the early work and we're gonna be able to see how it looks and the risks and the concerns, um, you know, before we get back there in the fall. Thank you. Next question goes to Blake Murphy from The Athletic. Hey Bobby, how are you doing, man? What's up, Blake? Um, I know you, you probably can't comment on the, the specifics with Jalen Harris. Um, and, and obviously the, the biggest hope is, is that, you know, he's getting whatever help and is in the program. Um, from a roster perspective, does that kind of thing shape or, or shift what you might do in the second round where, you know, you had this prospect pipeline that looked a certain way and now a guy you had in the plans is, um, like, does that shift much for you? Uh, I think, you know, logistically speaking, it was a two way. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't affect roster spots at time. I think it's probably more to, to your second point, which is, um, you know, now we have one less, you know, young developing player in our pipeline. Um, and obviously we want to support him. And, and to your point, hopefully he's, uh, getting all the care and support he needs. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think we're, you know, we have 17 man rosters. Now we have the G league. There's a lot of those guys. Right. And so if we're down one, to find one or two more now, um, to fill that, fill that, uh, fill that slot. But we view it, I think more as a large group of them. Um, and each one of them is unique in their own way. So now it's, you know, onto the next task, which is how we find, you know, a similar level of talent as him. Cool. Thanks Bobby. Final two questions for you, Bobby. First one goes to Aaron Rose from SI.com. Hey, Bobby, thanks for doing this. Um, we spoke to, I think it was you a little while ago and, and asked about what moving up to four meant. Um, I think you were excited, but wasn't franchise altering. Um, has your opinion of that jump changed? Are you more excited about that pick now um, than maybe you guys were a month ago? We always, you know, you always fall in love with your picks uh, the closer you get. But no, I think we feel similarly, which is, I think, a way I described it. Uh, back uh, on the lottery night was we felt like we kind of jumped a tier and so it doesn't guarantee anything, right? But I think it just, for us, increases the likelihood that the player is one of those, you know, um, really impactful guys. And so for us, we still feel similarly that, uh, I forget where we were slotted, seven or eight, um, that little that little mini jump we made uh, did get us into a different tier. And do you guys have any update on Siakam? Has his, is he progressing well? And do you expect he'll be back healthy sometime around the start of the season, maybe a little bit after? You know, timelines are tough, but we just had a, uh, you know, some of our medical staff go out and visit him. His rehab seems to be going really well. Um, seen some videos, he's, you know, starting to work on his range of movement. Um, and so by all accounts, like, you know, really positive for him. Thank you. Good luck tomorrow. Thanks. Final question for you, Bobby, goes to William Liu from Yahoo Sports Canada. Hey, Bobby. Um, I was going to ask about Pascal, so I just got to come up with another question on the spot. Um, no, I mean, normally in a, in a normal non-pandemic setting, you would bring the prospects to Toronto. You would get them to know your practice facilities, the arena, things like that. Um, how have you tried to sort of incorporate that, obviously, not being in the city? Have you guys made, I don't know, small videos or something like that to familiarize themselves with the city they'll be actually coming to? Good thing you asked. Well, we do. We have a full Toronto experience room set up here in Tampa so they can come in and see the city uh, videos, get us get a sense of, um, you know, obviously the, the famous sights and sounds. But uh, we did do that on purpose to, you know, it feels a little weird to invite a kid to play for the Toronto Raptors and come to Tampa. So we uh, we said, how can we make it a little bit more special or at least give them a feel of Toronto? Um, and then the obvious one is as soon as, you know, we get drafted, we want to get them up there as soon as possible, obviously, to figure out, you know, where they'll live and get a sense of the city. But I think it's a huge selling point that we know and um, and you all know is how much we love Toronto and the energy there and how much our players love it. And so I think that um, 
unfortunately is not a selling point now, but I think once they get up there, they'll, they'll have that uh, feeling as well. Can you give us some specifics? Like what, what is in that magical room, that magical Toronto portal? All the good restaurants to go to. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to buy, I don't want to bias anyone over the others. All right. All right. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah.